is our part five and our last uh, segment for today. So if you would go ahead and put down, I guess you've already probably put 41620, but this is our L30 week. I'd like you to take a look at the handout on Julius Caesar. We want to focus a little bit on Caesar today. He's such a incredibly important uh, figure in Roman history. And I'd like you to read this section. It says, Our Heritage, uh, paragraph 273, Julius Caesar. Let's look down one paragraph and read together. Gaius, excuse me, Gaius, that's how they would say it. Gaius Julius Caesar was born in 100 B.C. to a patrician family whose members flattered themselves on being so ancient they could trace their line all the way back to a divine ancestress, Venus, the mother of Aeneas. But in spite of their aristocratic lineage, the Julians had, in the early 1st century B.C., been associated with the political program of the common people. Whether from these connections or from personal conviction or from shrewd political insight into the way his ambitions could most easily be realized, and probably from all three, Caesar early adopted the popular cause against the senatorial clique, made up of a small number of noble families who had, room, who had ruled Rome well, but autocratically, for centuries. Caesar's stand alarmed the conservative dictator Sulla and nearly cost Caesar his life, but by a combination of gambler's daring, great acumen in wooing, the favor of the people, and an almost irresistible personal magnetism, he steadily made his way up the political ladder. Somewhat before 60 BC, he had allied himself with Crassus, a wealthy politician who underwrote the enormous debts Caesar had contracted, and in that year he joined Pompey, the greatest military hero of the time, and Crassus in the coalition called the First triumvirate, three-man rule. In, as a result, in 59 BC, Caesar was elected to the consulship, the highest office of the Roman government, and so dominated his colleague Bibulus that the year was jestingly called not the consulship of Caesar and Bibulus, but, quote, the consulship of Julius and Caesar, unquote. Many Senators, realizing the danger that Caesar presented to their conservative position, tried to restrict the importance of the command he would hold as an ex-consul. But by political maneuvering, Caesar won the proconsulship of Gaul and Illyricum. In all, he spent nine years in subjugating and governing Gaul. In the following pages, you're reading his own account. Okay, now... I'd like you to underline a few things that are really important. Number one, he was born in 100 B.C., that he believed he had uh, been associated with the political program of the common people. Be sure you underline that. Uh, be sure that you understand that he disagreed with Sulla because he began to champion the rights of the people and the favor of the people. He says here he was wooing the favor of of the people. And then note the first triumvirate with Crassus and Pompey and Caesar. And then note that uh, for nine years, 50 to 50, 58 to 50 BC, he was subjugating and governing Gaul. Okay, let's flip to the next page. And it mentions that at the very top, of the next page, it's 186. At the t start of his command, his attitude was a defensive one of simply protecting Italy. So in other words, when he started in Gaul, he just wanted to protect Italy and the Roman province in southern France from the barbarian tribes. Then he shifted to an aggressive attitude aimed at the reduction of all transalpine Gaul to the status of a Roman province. He probably realized that a good offense is the best defense. And so he went after these Gallic tribes and um, all of this 
uh, gives everyone the idea that he was a great military commander. Okay, now let's look at that second paragraph on 186, because here they evaluate some of his traits. And I'm going to let you read the rest of it, because you need to, but um, let's look at this paragraph just briefly. Unquestionably, he was a great military commander. And in, in class, of course, whenever you take time to read a section, you know, with a teacher or in class, whatever, mark that, you know, highlight it, put a bracket around it, because that would be something you'd want to go back, think about it a little bit. You know, Mr. Kinzer could ask me, what are some of the key ideas, key qualities that make him a great commander? Well, here they are. Here's a paragraph. So you might want to, you know, as you look things over, kind of try to learn the concept a little bit, okay? So here we go. Unquestionably, he was a great military commander, his absolute physical courage, his self-confidence, his iron will, his fairness, and his generosity with praise and rewards made him an unparalleled leader of men. Well, there, unparalleled means he's top. No one leads men like Caesar had. He was a master tactician, relying on great mobility to surprise his enemies, quick to adapt his maneuvers to the terrain, and to press every advantage in the field. He showed no less skill in dealing with the people of Gaul, capitalizing on their failure to unite and on their vacillation, trusting those who became his allies. Some say, some would say he trusted them too much and employing harsh punishments only when the offender's rebelliousness was incorrigible. So you have a little bit of a taste of Julius Caesar there. So be sure to read the rest of the article. It gives you a, a good flavor. It's one of the best articles I've, I've run across for Caesar. Now, on the next page, there's the altar marking the spot where Caesar's body was burned. Actually, he wasn't killed there. He was burned there. So I'm sorry. I, I think I said earlier that he had been knifed there. Now, the second um, article is about Caesar's army and the American army. And so I'm going to uh, uh, jump down to uh, uh, the groupings down there on 188 and mention that, uh, that these are things that you need to learn. These will be in your notes. So go ahead and uh, you can read along here, but we're going to um, mention that a legion strength a legion of the Roman, Emperor, uh, Roman Empire army was 6,000 men. And it mentions that not all those men were there. It was not all, you know, there were sick, there were people who uh, quit. And so the average size was actually about 3,200 men. And uh, it was comparable to a division in the U.S. Army. So if we make a little chart here with the U.S. Army on the right and Julius Caesar's army, the Roman army, uh, you're going to see how well organized this really was. They had a legion, which was similar to our division. Okay, Now, in the legion, uh, the legion was broken down into smaller units. There were ten cohorts. So that means that each cohort would be about 600 men. Okay, What was the U.S. Um, equivalent was the battle group. And a battle group, I think, had about five um, companies. Five companies. So a company today has about 200 men in it, and five of them together or a battle group. Okay. The next the next thing that we we need to uh, understand is that these cohorts, which were smaller units of six hundred men, each of those were divided into three manipulates. Okay, so one cohort was equal to three 
manipulates. Uh, let me unspell that. So the manipulates, you know what, that's not very clear. Let me do that again, get that right for you. And so each manipulate then is 200 men. And then one manipulate was equal to two uh, centuries. And that's probably the one that we're most familiar with because a century had a hundred men. It was led by a what centurion. So that um, the centurion in the century was the key unit. Now the Romans called that the ordo, the ordo, and it had a hundred men to it. So it's kind of easy to remember, if you remember the century had 100 men, the legion has 6,000 men when it's full strength, so that's 60 centuries. So one legion equals 60 centuries, or 60 ordos. And this uh, compares to the U.S., uh, where, where our manipulate really is uh, likened to a company. A company generally has about 200 men. The company is uh, four platoons. And so uh, you drop down to the uh, century or the ordo, and we're really looking at one platoon. A platoon has about 50 men. And of course, there's squads. In, uh, as you break that down. And uh, so now looking at your sheet uh, on the right page, page 189, you can see that there's a picture uh, that breaks this down for you. So that century is right up front there. It's the big one. And then you can see that there are two centuries in a, in a manipulus. And then there's three manipulus in a, or manipuli, in a cohort. And then there's um, ten of the cohorts. So there's ten of those six uh, unit cohorts in a legion. So that very top diagram is actually what a legion looks like. And notice how it worked. Uh, all of those units could move independently. So if a commander very quickly said he wanted, um, you know, an attack on the, the enemy's left side by 10 uh, manipuli, you know, they could, they, they could just number them off and those 10 manipuli or 20 ordo, 20 centuries would rush up and attack. So it's very maneuverable. So here's some advantages that we see with the uh, Roman army. Very maneuverable. They could maneuver uh, very organized. Maneuver. Very organized. In fact, the Romans really won on their organization. Uh, organization... Uh, won so many battles for the Romans. Uh, they, the Romans won on this. Uh, this was what saved them, is that you know they would have a, an ambush and part of their uh, legion would be cut off and they could turn around you know, a certain number uh, of cohorts and go back. And, and so it was very easy to maneuver. Okay? Now if you look on the next page you can see, and I do want you to read this whole thing, but um, make sure you oh, uh, uh, yeah, go to the next page, page 190, and notice there are in, in this legion there are also auxiliaries. These are light armed troops. Uh, these were not Roman troops, they were from other states. They also had slingers called 
fundatores who were from the Balearic Islands. So they slung, um, you know, like uh, uh, rocks uh, or different objects in a sling. Okay. And then there were Sagittari who were bowmen or archers. And these were from Crete, which was noted for its bowmen. And they had non-combatants, and they had camp servants, mule drivers, traders. And you see the Roman name for each one of those uh, non-combatants. Then you get down to personnel, the enlisted men. You had Miles Legionarius, which was a legionary soldier. I'd like you to underline this section. A legionary soldier was usually a citizen volunteer who enlisted for the regular term of 20 years. So note 20 years was the amount of time that they spent in the army. Then they could leave, and they were given some land as sort of a payment or an inheritance. Roman citizens between the ages of 17 and 46 were subject to a military draft. So all through Rome, they, everyone served. There was a draft. And uh, they, they would select names, uh, and you had to go. You had to go serve in the army. But you could also be a volunteer, and you would volunteer for 20 years, so you'd become a professional soldier. And they did have people who stayed in longer than the 20 years. And those were uh, great guys to have in the army because of their experience. And look at number three, a signifer is a standard bearer of the manipuli, and it resembled the the modern color bearer, so they would carry the standard, okay? And the standard would have the name of their unit on uh, on this big Roman eagle. Then we had number four, the aquilifer, which is the bearer of the eagle, which is the emblem of of the legion. So you had a signifer and you also had an aquilifer. And then number five, you had a centurio. Each of the 60 centuries of the legion was in charge of a a centurion, um, a non-commissioned officer appointed from the ranks in recognition of brave and efficient service. So this was in a very similar way. This would be similar to our sergeant. Our sergeant is non-commissioned. That means he's not. he didn't go to West Point. He has become a sergeant because his soldiers, uh, his comrades, uh, appreciated and recognized his leadership. And so he becomes uh, a sergeant. And then you have their non-commissioned, excuse me, of your commissioned officers at the bottom. Now this would be the, the formal upper layer of their officers. They had tribunes. They had six tribunes in the army per legion. So would you underline that? Six tribunes. And this talks a little bit about them. And then number two, they had a quaestor, which is like the quartermaster. And they had a legatus, who was the staff officers who helped the uh, general. The general's was a dux, D-U-X, and sometimes called the imperator. After winning an important victory, he would be known as the imperator. And then they actually had assistants like engineers, fabri. Now we get the word fabricate or to make. You know, engineers would be making siege engines, bridges, building ships. You had speculatores, which were spies, and you had exploratories, which were mounted scouts or patrols. So you get the idea that it was a very complex, uh, very uh, you know organized, and very complete um, uh, fighting unit. You had men who were able to accomplish every task needed for the success of that group. So complete fighting unit, and that was the legion, known for its uh, its organization, and uh, and then they were highly drilled, they were highly trained. So the training, see, also training in and of itself. If you have enough training, you can beat a better organized 
foe, but not only were the Romans organized, but they were also trained. So they won on organization. If there's one phrase I'd like you to remember, uh, of course I want you to remember all this, but the Romans won on organization. Okay. So with that, we're going to flip over to Caesar and look at a couple pages. So if you would grab your Conquest of Gaul uh, book, and let's turn to page 65. And we're going to be looking just at a few sections here for not very much time, but we want to draw your attention to a couple things. On page 65, there's um, near the top of the page, um, it says the Ambiani were neighbors of the Nervi, about whose character and habits Caesar made inquiry. He learned that they did not admit traitors into their country and would not allow the importation of wine or other luxuries because they thought such things made men soft and took the edge off their courage, that they were a fierce, warlike people who bitterly reproached the other Belgae for throwing away their inheritance of bravery by submitting to the Romans and vowed that they would never ask for peace or accept it on any terms. So that's a good statement to remember that the Nervi were uh, uh, never going to ask for peace or accept it. So the next paragraph, paragraph 16, after three days march through Nervian territory, Caesar learned from prisoners that the river Sambre was not more than 10 miles from the place where he had encamped. And that all the Nervian troops were posted on the farther side of it, awaiting the arrival of the Romans. Already with them in the field, he was told they were the neighbors, the Atrebates and the Viromandui, Viromandui, whom they had persuaded to try the fortune of war along with them. And they were expected to be joined by the forces of the Atunatsi, who were already on the way. They had hastily thrust their women and all who were thought too young or too old to fight into a place which Mars's marshes made inaccessible to the enemy. So let's. I'm going to make a note here that you need to uh, review page 65, and we're making some notes here. Now notice what... Caesar does. On receiving this information, Caesar sent forward a reconnoitering party, so that's like a scouting party, accompanied by some centurions to choose a good site for a camp. The large number of Gauls, including some of the Belgae, who had surrendered, had attached themselves to Caesar and were marching with the troops. Some of these, as was afterwards ascertained from prisoners, had observed the order in which our army marched the previous days. So notice that they're noticing the organization. They notice the order that the army was marching during the previous days. And at night made their way to the Nervi, Nervi excuse me, and explained to them that each legion was separated from the following one by a long baggage train so that when the first reached camp, the others would be far away. It would be quite easy to attack it while the men were still burdened with their packs. And when it was routed and its baggage plundered, the others would not dare to make a stand. So in other words, here's a weakness of the Romans' uh, march. They have a, between each legion just a baggage train that's not very well protected. There was one thing that favored the execution of the plan suggested by these deserters. The Nervi have virtually no cavalry. To this day, they pay no attention to that arm. Their whole strength, page 66, consisting of infantry. So long ago, they devised a method of hindering their neighbor's cavalry when it, came, when it made plundering raids into their territory. They cut off the tops of saplings, bent them over, and let a thick growth of side branches shoot out in between them they planted briars and thorns, and, they, and thus made hedges like walls, 
which gave such protection that no one could even see through them, much less penetrate them. As these obstacles hindered the march of our column, the Nervi thought the proposed, the proposed plan too good to leave untried. So let's see how the Romans deal with this. Uh, let's look at verse or, uh, uh, paragraph 19, page 66. Caesar had sent his cavalry a little in advance and was following with the rest of his forces, but the column was formed up in a different manner from that which the Belgic deserters had described to the Nervi. In accordance with his usual practice when approaching an enemy, Caesar marched at the head of the column with six legions, unencumbered by heavy baggage. Then came the transport of the entire army, protected by the two newly enrolled legions that brought up the rear. So note here, he's got eight legions, and when they're approaching the enemy, they put six legions up front. So what do you think the uh, advantage of that would be? Well, he'd have his fighting men up front where he'd probably meet the enemy, but they wouldn't have baggage trains in between each legion. So the legions could what? Yeah, they could maneuver. They could move around better. They could respond to a fight. So let's, t let's see. Now they're going to come into the fight. Uh, bottom of 66. First of all, our cavalry crossed the river with the slingers and archers and engaged the enemy's horsemen. These kept on retiring into the wood where their comrades were and then reappearing to charge our troops who dared not pursue them beyond the end of the open ground. Meanwhile, the six legions that were the first to arrive measured out the ground and began to construct the camp. The Gauls, concealed in the wood, had already formed up in battle order and were waiting full of confidence. As soon as they caught sight of the head of the baggage train, the moment which they had agreed upon for starting the battle, they suddenly dashed out in full force and swooped down on our cavalry, which they easily routed. Now, routed means they just ran them away. So the cavalry fled. They retreated. Then they ran down to the river at such an incredible speed that almost at the same moment they seemed to be at the edge of the wood, in the water, and already upon us. With equal rapidity, they climbed the hill toward our camp to attack the men who were busy entrenching it. So this looks like a catastrophe. It looks like the Gauls are going to win this. Let's see what Caesar does. Now we're on page 67, and look at paragraph number 20. And I would, just as we're reading this, I would mark these, and so you can go back to it and maybe make some notes in the, in the paragraph out in the margin. But let's look at, at uh, paragraph 20. Caesar had everything to do at once, hoist the flag, which was the signal for running to arms, recall the men from their work on the camp, fetch back those who'd gone far afield in search of material for the rampart, form the battle line, address the men, and sound the trumpet signal for going into battle. Much of this could not be done in a short time, left available by the enemy's swift onset. But the situation was saved by two things. Now let's see what, see now this is showing his great analysis, okay, because a commander analyzes the situation. Let's see what he says are the things that saved them. They were saved by two things. First, the knowledge and experience of the soldiers, so he's giving credit to the Roman organization, right, whose training in early battles in, enabled them to decide for themselves what needed doing without waiting to be told. Secondly, the order uh, which Caesar had issued to all his generals, not to leave the work but to stay, each with his own legion, until the camp fortifications were completed. As the enemy was so close and advancing so swiftly, the generals did not wait for further, further orders, but on their own responsibility took the measures they thought proper. So see, they're well trained. They, they spring into action. Uh, now look at 21. After Let's see what Caesar does. After giving the minimum of essential orders, Caesar hastened down to the battlefield 
to address the troops, and he happened to come first upon the Tenth Legion, to which he made only a short speech, urging them to live up to their tradition of bravery, to keep their nerve, and to meet the enemy's attack boldly. Then, as the Nervi were within range, he gave the signal for battle. On going to the other side of the field to address the troops there, he found them ready in action, already in action. The soldiers were so pushed for time by the enemy's eagerness to fight that they could not even take the covers off their shields or put on helmets, not to speak of fixing on crests or decorations. Each man, on coming down from his work at the camp, went into action under the first standard he happened to see so as not to waste time searching for his own unit. The battlefront was not formed according to the rules of military theory, but as necessitated by the emergency in the sloping ground on the hillside. The legions were facing different ways and fighting separate actions, and thick hedges obscured their view. The result was that Caesar could not fix upon definite points for stationing reserves or foresee what would be needed in each part of the field, and unity of command was not was impossible. In such diver, adverse circumstances, there were naturally ups and downs of fortune. And so he's going to describe the battle, and he's uh, looking at this, and I'd like you, uh, because we're out of time, but I, I would like you all to review pages 65 all the way up through 73. Just take it to 73, review it, reread it, and, uh, you know, kind of see, uh, uh, you know, how does he an analyze the battle? And, and I'd like to just, you know, if you make a couple notes to yourself, what were some of the positive things that the Romans did in this situation? Were there any negative things? Now, obviously, they're hit by surprise. You could probably say um, that they they should have had uh, more of a, a warning system, or they should have had troops out, scouts out further in front, you know. But uh, as you could see, Caesar had put six legions out front. He knew he was running into soon enemy resistance. He knew that the Nervi were up ahead. So, but you can kind of see that he was very wise in this, and yet there might be some things that you could see that they might be able to do a little bit better. So I'm going to leave that to you, and thank you for uh, doing that. I wish I could, we could have a discussion on it. Um, so just kind of use this time in place of a discussion and uh, uh, learn the different units of the Roman army, and we will look forward to, to seeing you guys eventually. God bless you, and I hope you enjoy learning about the Romans. Pretty fascinating people. Pretty, pretty interesting. Pretty interesting to see how they, uh, they go in and attack these tribes. So uh, Caesar is definitely on the offensive. He's not just defending the transalpine uh, province from the uh, Helvetii, who were moving from one area to another. Uh, now he's gone into Gaul. He may uh, have the, the feel that you know he needs a, 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 the, the best defense is a good offense. That's an interesting statement. So kind of be thinking about that too as you read. God bless you, and we'll talk to you all soon. Uh, have a great week ahead. Bye-bye.